This episode contains discussions including recounts of queer discrimination, anorexia, bulimia, compulsive overexercising, body dysmorphia, recounts of fat phobia, heavy religious themes, mention of pornography. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Body Story Podcast, a show about the way we're navigating the world in the bodies we've been given. I'm your host, Tiffany Eller, and I believe that if one person's story can change the way you look at them, a collection of stories may be able to change the world. Today, I'll be speaking with Reverend Dr. Angela Yarber, the Executive Director of the Holy Women Icons Project, a nonprofit seeking to empower marginalized women by telling the stories of revolutionary holy women through art, writing, and special events. She holds a PhD in art and religion with an emphasis on the role of women's bodies in world religions. Angela is also a retired professional dancer, award-winning author, artist, and queer clergywoman. Affirming and celebrating the body is a big part of her folk feminist iconography, intersectional feminist writing, and the retreats and courses she teaches. Let's get into the episode. Hi, Angela. Thanks for joining us today. Sure. Thanks so much for having me, Tiffany. Yeah. So before we get into your body story, can you tell me a little bit about what the Holy Women Icons Project is? Sure. So it's a mix of things that we'll probably unpack throughout the episode. But basically, for about a decade, I've been painting icons of women where I give traditional iconography a folk feminist twist. So folk is the style and feminism is the lens. And it's revolutionary women from history, mythology, and a few archetypes. And I've painted over a hundred of them over the past decade or so that are in homes and galleries all over the world. And then I tell the the stories of these women through writing in online platforms like Miss Magazine, Feminism and Religion, and also in a few books that I've published. And then the stories of these women inspire and enliven the events that I lead, whether it's like a public talk or an academic course where students come out to Hawaii Island for a one-week intensive or the retreats that I lead. Because I think that in knowing about these women from history and mythology, we can know more about ourselves. We can uncover different histories that have been hidden in the crevices of our canons at best or strategically erased at worst and see the way they approach their bodies and their lives and spirituality and politics and the world. And all of that can help us be more justice, peace-minded people in our world today. I love that. I I love your whole project. And I've read some of your stuff. You sent me over an article that you wrote about... um, your experience of having your first shower after living in a national forest for, what, a few months? Yes, yes. Uh, Do you want me to say a bit more about that? Uh, Sure, because when I was reading it, I didn't get to finish the whole thing. Um, But you're a beautiful writer, and the, the content was fascinating. Oh, thank you. So that's the, the funny story. Well, it started with a not so funny beginning was um, I had a really toxic job. I was a pastor for 14 years and my the stacks of my hate mail grew thicker and thicker and um, and the microaggressions about sexism and heterosexism really raged. And so I, I discerned that I needed to leave. And so after that discernment process, my wife and I decided to you know leave our job, sell our home and travel full time with our toddler for almost two years. And the first spot that we went was the Green Mountain National Forest in Vermont. And we were living in a little off-grid camper. We didn't have running water. And we were there for three months as campground hosts. And because we had no access to running water, that meant that we didn't have any access to showers. So (laughs) we would bathe in the lake or sometimes there was an inn that would let us use their outdoor Um, spigot and things like that, that we could hike to. But uh, when family came to visit, they said, why don't we, you know, pay for you to stay in a hotel for a couple of nights while we're visiting, mostly because they didn't want to come and rough it in the woods. So I had this experience of showering and then seeing myself and my body in the mirror for the first time in several months. And it had a really profound impact on me that I wasn't expecting because I have, as I'm sure we'll talk about, a history of eating disorders and body dysmorphia that I work really hard to deal with and and approach through a body positive and fat positive lens now. 
But when I saw myself, it was, um, to use religious terms, it was almost like a baptism because I had gotten out of this shower for the first time in months. And I saw myself really sun-kissed and mosquito-bitten. And instead of finding the flaws in my body, which I think most women do in America when we look at our bodies in the mirror, I saw, you know, these strong legs that had hiked 10 miles with my toddler in a pack as he recited his ABCs for the first time. Or I kind of looked at my stomach with pride and said, you know, it's been 15 years since I've purged a meal. Um, And that's something to be really proud of. And that even now, if I thrust my fist in the air in protest, even though there's a little part of me that's like, oh, I hope I see a thin defined tricep and I rage against that thinking like, how unfeminist is that? I want to acknowledge that's real. That's something that's happening in my mind and in my body that's always going to be there. And it takes a lot of body positivity and queering and feministing and subverting to try to overcome that on a daily basis. So that was the crux of that article. <laughs> how beautiful, though. I, I bet that's an experience not a lot of people get, get to experience. I think so. I feel so fortunate that we took that time to travel and discern and choose to live really, really simply so that in that in those years, we, you know, we gave up our full time jobs. At that point, we were professors, my wife and I, um, and we chose to live really simply. So that meant that, you know, we we're living on like a thousand dollars a month that I could bring in from my writing and my art sales and things like that. And we just chose to live incredibly simply and spend time as a family and really discern our next steps, which is what kind of led me to settle here on Hawaii Island and to turn the Holy Women Icons Project into a nonprofit organization. Oh, yeah. I'm so excited to hear more about the nonprofit, but we've kind of gotten into your body story a little bit. So um, do we want to jump into that and then we'll kind of weave it back into uh, about your project and how you arrived at that as a project? based on your experience? Sure. That sounds amazing. And in my mind, they're completely connected. But I know that from the outside looking in, it's like, hmm, how does this body story relate to this project? But it does. So I can (laughs) say a bit more about that. Um, So you had mentioned ahead of time to think about where my body story begins. And I thought that's a really complicated question. And I hated that almost every beginning that I thought of was negative. And so I decided I want to start with a positive, and that is my mother. My mother, who was a single mom who raised three children on her own, a uh, working class family, and who didn't have a lot of access to the privileges of higher education and things like that, um, and who is, has a fat body and is fat positive in a lot of ways and raised me in a lot of really body positive ways. And, and the fat positivity, I didn't even come to until my 30s, honestly, um, because I held a lot of fat phobia that was internalized from like culture and religion inside of me. So I had this awesome mom and this long line of awesome feminists from her family who, you know, raised me and instilled in me a great sense of worth and um, not in feminism that was something that they talked about, but something that they embodied and lived that was really beautiful. So I'm so grateful that I had that. And yet, even amidst that, even amidst having this amazing strong mother who was nothing but positive, which is a big contrast to the way a lot of girls are raised with mothers who shame them or tell them that they need to be a certain size, that even amidst that body positivity, Everything from culture still found its way into my body. And then later in life, everything from religion found its way into my body that I internalized in really unhealthy ways. So I think the negative side of things started was um, I was a professional dancer for a long time. And so that meant I danced when I was younger and developed eating disorders in middle school. And then again in college with... um, elements of anorexia and bulimia and body dysmorphia and then compulsive over-exercising. And as I was introduced to the Christian tradition, it was handed to me as a very conservative form of that tradition. And um, as you likely know, and your listeners likely know, a lot of that really shames and demeans women's bodies and tells us that our bodies are something that need to be overcome, that they are agents for less, specifically for men. Um, and so they're objectified in those ways and said are, are, are bad or sinful. 
And so I internalized all of that. And then I took it deeper in a lot of ways where I didn't think I was worth the space I occupied in the world. And I was taught to be like Jesus. And I looked at images of Jesus. And most of them, if you look at carefully, um, depictions of Jesus on the cross, he's quite emaciated and thin. And um, it seems silly on the one hand, but there are histories of a lot of uh, women throughout church history who have had eating disorders specifically because of looking at these images and trying to turn their bodies into into looking like Jesus. So being like Jesus and the fact that we deny ourselves food, that we take up our cross, so to speak, our bodies. And I learned about these histories of women like mystics in the Christian tradition who are greatly admired like Catherine of Siena, for example, who gave all of her food away to the poor and then purged the Eucharist by sticking a a twig down her throat. The Eucharist is, in that tradition, the body and blood of Jesus. So she would take that and then throw it up. And today people would call that anorexia mirabilis or the miraculous loss of appetite. Um, And so I learned about all those things and then I was becoming that in my body, if that makes any sense. And for me, it was learning about feminist theology and then feminist philosophy that started to set me free and make me realize that my body was not an object of shame, that my body wasn't something to overcome, but it was a a full part of who I am. It was a full part of my spirituality. And so even though I'll freely admit that it's something that I continue to struggle with in some ways, I think that intersectional feminism and my queerness coming out later in life um, has helped me to embrace the fullness of my body and the positivity of my body and what my body teaches me in ways that my original religious tradition kind of stripped away. Um, And I know that that's a, a mix of like theory and history and all these things, but for me as an artist and an academic and a a spiritual person, all of those are so intertwined in my blood and in my bones and in my veins that it's impossible not to talk about them with talking about my body story. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've had a very similar trajectory in, in learning about my body. The more I learn about religious figures like that, like you're talking about in like the feminist iconography and stuff, I get more empowered. So I totally understand um, where you're coming from with that. So when you started studying, well, did you start studying religion and then get into like the feminist studies? Yeah, it was kind of a mix. So I was a weird adolescent in that as a middle schooler and early high schooler, um, I was a vegetarian and vegan and really into feminism and like marched in protests and things like that. So that was my strange way of rebelling. Um, And then when I had this conservative religious experience, they essentially told me all of that was bad and wrong and that my career in the performing arts and all of those things were bad and wrong. So there were about two years of my life where I put all of that behind me because I kind of thought I had to. And then very luckily for me, I had these religious studies professors in college, interestingly, all of whom were men, but who believed in me and said, you know, this feminism that you've held so dear, the arts that you've held so dear for so much of your life, they don't have to be mutually exclusive from spirituality or the study of religion. You can put those two things together. And so even though I had a couple of years around the age 17, 18, where I was shunning all of that, I really got to reclaim it in really powerful ways and was was introduced to feminist theology and then later on philosophy when I kind of let the theos part of things go. So that merging of feminism and spirituality and the arts was really ultimately some of the foundation that led to the creation of the Holy Women Icons Project. Yeah. Can you tell me about like the conception of that idea? Sure. So I think that that might happen with um, the memories that started the project and then the actual starting. So I think back now, you know, over a decade later of doing this work, I think back to 20 years ago, 1999, I'm hunkered in this Russian Orthodox church as the American embassy is being bombed. And I'm confronted with this sensory overload of Russian icons. And I scan the whole scene to see this brooding 
whitewashed cavalcade of men (laughs) staring back at me with their hands uplifted in this frightening benediction. And I find myself wondering, where are all the women? And then 15 years later, I find myself doing research in the Middle East, and I'm on the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt at St. Catherine's Monastery, which is the has the oldest collection of icons in the Christian tradition. And I scan the scene with hundreds of icons filling the chapel. And I scan the scene and I only see two women. One is Mary, the mother of Jesus. And we could spend a whole episode talking about the way her body has been treated because it was essentially co-opted by what most people assume is a male God and impregnated. And so we have her. And then the other woman that was depicted in iconography there was a woman from the Jewish and Christian tradition called Jephthah's daughter. She didn't even have a name. And her body was burned and sacrificed as an offering by her father. And that says something to me about this tradition. So I'm asking, where are all the women? Then several years later, I'm in Thailand at the Temple of a Thousand Buddhas. And of course, no women are portrayed. And so this says something and does something. So about 10 years ago, I had painted this triptych, which is a three-piece work of art, of Sophia Wisdom, which is like a feminine or feminist version of Jesus for this exhibition at an an art studio. And as I painted that, it was right before the Christian tradition of Lent, which is when a lot of people give up things, deny their bodies to identify with Jesus denying and fasting for 40 days in the wilderness. And so I decided instead of giving something up, I was going to take something on. And that practice was going to be each week, the six weeks of Lent, I was going to research and write about a revolutionary woman from that tradition and paint an icon of her with a folk twist to make it more accessible because most of iconography I found inaccessible. And so I did that. And by the end of that season, I had these six paintings, these six writings, and a list of over a hundred women that I still wanted to paint. And that's kind of how the Holy Women Icons Project was born, that I researched and learned about these revolutionary women from history and mythology and expanded outside of just that tradition. So women from a variety of faith and wisdom traditions and ones that aren't explicitly related to a tradition like Audre Lorde or Frida Kahlo, for example, but who help us find our own innate worth. And in doing that, um, in my PhD program, I also studied iconography and other traditions. So like I looked at Buddhist iconography and learned about the role of the body in depictions of Guan Yin, for example, who's the Buddhist goddess of compassion and mercy, and learned that, for example, in depictions of her, her fingers are always webbed. Because when she scoops up all those who are suffering in her hands, no one can slip through the cracks between her fingers and her embrace. Or I learned about um, Hindu iconography of a lot of goddesses of uh, Sarasvati, for example, the Hindu goddess of arts and learning, and how she's always depicted either on water in a lotus because that's a symbol of enlightenment or or of nirvana. And so I took these things and wanted to say, you know, I want to paint these revolutionary women from traditions outside of my own, but not in a way that appropriates them or wrongly wrongly takes them away um, from mostly women of color and other traditions. But I want to paint them in a way that I can tell that story alongside these amazing subversive sister saints and honor really every ounce of our bodies in doing that. And so something that I did uh, stylistically in my painting is that I started researching um, paintings and artwork from within women's spirituality. And I was really dismayed because I discovered that most of it is um, is white women's spirituality and that it kind of takes women from other traditions and then paints them by highlighting like breasts and hips and all of these things that are typically shamed and shunned or objectified in women. But I was looking at it through the lens of an art historian, stick with me on this, and that if I were to describe it, like with a formal analysis, not the the meaning behind it, but just the content, that the description would be really similar to that of like Playboy, because there's this alluring gaze, there are breasts and hips that are emphasized, and that that's lifted up as what is essentially women. And we know that like the meaning behind it is different because in spirituality, the women are the subject rather than the object. And then in like Playboy and porn, women are the object. 
but stylistically they're really similar. And so I really wanted to subvert that and dismantle that. And so in all of my paintings, rather than painting like the torso of each woman, I paint a giant heart. And then I write on the heart what is kind of the cry of that woman's heart or the essence of her life. And then she has her face and her arms coming out of the heart. And I didn't want to negate the body, but I couldn't find a way to do it where I was honoring every way that it means to be um, a woman or it means to be someone who is gender non-binary or gender queer. And so I thought the best way to do that is really to elevate our hearts rather than different elements of our bodies that some, some women have, some women do not. For some women, they're empowering. For some, it's objects of shame. And so for me, highlighting the heart was the most important part of telling these women's stories. That's my favorite part of your art, honestly. Oh, thank you. I, lo- I love that. I love that that's the theme that ties them all together because you're absolutely right about everything you said. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, I just love it. I'm occasionally concerned that I dive too much into academia, but I, I think so much of it is so practical and real um, that I think it's worth saying. And so much of it, at least for me, is things that I you know, that crossed my mind and looking at a lot of depictions of women's bodies and, you know, like quote unquote spiritual art. And then for me, it was really validating to read other (laughs) scholars, especially women of color who were critiquing it and be like, oh yeah, like it's not just me who's the weirdo who's thinking this, like this is legit stuff that's going on. And, And to be, yeah, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So who have you found? I know that like your art is it's feminist and so therefore mostly for women, but have you found that any certain um, types of audiences have come through to you to like purchase your pieces or really enjoy your pieces more? Oh, that's a great question. And um, frankly, it's helpful for me because I'm not a business minded person at all. And so in running a nonprofit, you know, we also have to like earn a living And so helping me figure out my key demographics is a helpful question, but um, definitely there are, I have a lot of supporters who find the work empowering who are women clergy and specifically queer women clergy, because there are not very many depictions of women and then certainly not queer women and then definitely not queer women of color. And so a lot of women who are the same demographic as the painting for example, have found that really empowering. And, um, and then I've had this really strange subset of supporters who are men in the South, like progressive feminist queer men in the South, um, who are really enlivened by the work, which I find very meaningful because the subversive sisterhood of saints includes people across the gender spectrum, not just women. Um, and I've done a lot of work as a queer person who is cisgender um, within the trans community. And so that's been really enlivening for me, both in calling out, like I've painted some queer feminist women who historically were not very trans positive. And so that's been um, enlivening to be called out and called in in that and to say, you know, we need to cr- critique them more, but also to do more depictions of women who either identify as trans or who w- might have used that language had that language been accessible to them during the time that they lived. Um, so those are a lot of communities. And then um, folks who are interested in goddess work through a social justice lens have typically found interest in the Holy Women Icons Project. And then just kind of everyday folks, moms who are struggling and exhausted and like to see depictions that reflect their realities or, you know, women in the workplace who want to see mirrors of themselves reflected in positions of leadership and power, that it's not just chipping away at the stained glass ceiling, which is real, but in some ways the the real glass ceiling, that it's a depiction of that comment or that phrase, if you can't see it, you can't be it. So this is an opportunity to see it, to see someone like Polly Murray, for example, who was a pivotal voice in the civil rights movement, who wrote what Thurgood Marshall called the Bible of the civil rights movement, who was a queer black woman who likely, if she had had the access to the language, would have identified as trans and who also became the first 
African-American woman ordained as an Episcopal priest in her 60s who like served her first communion at the church where her grandmother, who was then a slave, was baptized. Like amazing revolutionary women like that who why was it that I was like 32 years old when I first learned her story? So being able to kind of lift up women who can see images and reflections of themselves in these women from history has been really enlivening and empowering. If I can go back a little bit, you're talking about finding these stories of, uh, you know, these past women or trans people. Is it hard to find that history? Like, do you find that it's harder to seek out because a lot of that history has been kind of pushed down? I would say yes and no. Yes, in the sense that I look back and think, how is it that I did a bachelor's in religious studies, went to seminary, did a PhD in this specific field, and finished without knowing about Polly Murray, for example? And I think, how is that even possible? Um, And simultaneously now, because this is the work that I do, I find it everywhere to where, you know, my list of women from history and mythology that I want to paint is much longer than I've had time to create. You know, for the over 100 that I've created, there's still over 100 on a list that I haven't yet painted and written about and researched more fully. So it's kind of a mix of those things that it depends on where you're going with your research. And that's part of the work that we do at the Holy Women Icons Project, especially with these new retreats that I'm leading on Hawaii Island and the courses that I'm teaching where like seminaries and universities partner with us and they send out a group of like eight to 12 students for a week and they take what is essentially a three credit course where we're focusing on these women. And it's, you know, a course that I've taught in the past when I was a professor of women's gender and sexuality studies called Women, History and Myth, where we're essentially unpacking these women. And then students have opportunities to do really in-depth research in their particular field of study. So like if they're a psychology major, they would research women psychologists or something and, and write a big paper about them. And then that introduces me to someone who I wouldn't have otherwise learned about because psychology is not my field, for example. Um, So part of the reason behind creating these courses is because students everywhere, people everywhere, and then I think seminarians in particular, need to know these stories, that the story of Polly Murray is just as important as the story of Thurgood Marshall. And yet we hear his story and should, but not hers. And so to try to lift these up And I often say, I'll reference back to Jephthah's daughter, who I talked about in St. Catherine's Monastery. Um, I say to students who are training in either the Jewish tradition or the Christian tradition, every time you're preaching about Isaac, the sacrifice of Isaac, you need to talk about the sacrifice of Jephthah's daughter, because she's the one who's killed. Isaac is not. Um, He's spared. Um, And so to be able to tell students about this and find the resources, and that when we talk about them in community, it's not just me as professor or teacher who teaches them, but there's always, every time I talk to someone, um, I learn about someone new. Like even in listening to you and your podcast, I have a note that I want to listen to your most recent one with the Paralympic athlete whose name I am now forgetting. Sammy Tucker. Yes, Sammy Tucker, who, you know, I just started following her on Instagram and thinking, wow, here's this amazing woman that I hadn't heard of. But because I'm connecting with you, I'm learning about her revolutionary story. Right. And so the answer to that question is yes and no. It depends on who you're talking to. It depends on what books you're reading, what programs you're studying in, what you have access to. The stories are out there. They just take a lot of uncovering, a lot of um, contemporary excavation, if you will, (laughs) to find them because they're there and they're powerful and they deserve to be told and heard. And so I just want everyone to shout them from the rooftops. That's amazing. I I feel like I have a similar conversation often with other people about uh, when, when people come to me and they're like, you're the only person I know doing this, doing X, Y, Z. And I'm like, well, the more you talk about it, the more you attract it. Cause yes. that's what I found is like, I, especially in my spiritual journey at first, I was like, I'm the only one that believes this weird stuff because this isn't what I grew up on. Right. And the more I started talking about it, the more I realized, Oh, there's a ton of people around me that 
that also believe the same thing or are curious about it. And like, right. just with the, with the internet, we have so much access to anything, anyone that we could ever possibly want to be exposed to that there's really no excuse. <laughs> right, completely. And what's really amazing, I think, is that um, in the work that you're doing and and I hope the work that I'm doing is that we are telling our own stories, which are powerful, but we're also pointing to others. So like your work is situated alongside Roxane Gay and Lindy West, who are doing amazing body positivity work, right? And my work is, I hope, situated alongside a lot of other revolutionary, subversive sister saints who are doing this work. And that it's not just about elevating our own story, but telling it and then telling it alongside others as well so that people don't feel so alone so you know we don't feel like we're the only weirdos the cookies and our you know spiritual traditions that there are others like us and that we can help one another be stronger and more inspired and help the world be a better place by sharing those stories yes yeah that's a huge reason I wanted to do this podcast because I I had a body story that like I had shared during public speaking and stuff like that. And it had made a difference to the people I spoke to, but I also recognized that my story wasn't the thing that was going to resonate with everybody in terms Mm -hmm. of achieving self-worth. And so it was like, well, how can I still be a voice for as many people as I can possibly uplift, but also not center myself in the middle of it? Because, you know, I am a able-bodied cis white girl. Right. (laughs) So like, um, just just providing this space has been such a gift for me too, because I get to talk to people like you. <laughs> well, that's generous. You know? I love the way you put it at the beginning of I don't want to mess it up, but it's um, you know that a story can change a person, and many stories can change the world. Yeah, it's, um, and I think that that's resonates so true in your work, and also in the work of the Holy Women Icons Project that. These stories, these images, these revolutionary women, be they the one that I'm talking to right now, you, or these historical and mythological ones, that it it shapes and, and changes the world and that can change lives and make the world and people's lives a more just and beautiful place. Mm, mm-hmm. I totally, uh, you're, you're of my heart. <laughs> <laughs> you too. I love it. <laughs> So I have a few questions that we haven't touched on, or maybe we've touched a little bit on, uh, but for my, the the script that I have that I want to touch before I let you go, because we probably have about, I don't know, 15 minutes left. Okay. Okay. So how would you define a queer intersectionally feminist approach to the body? That is such a good question. And I was actually talking about this with my wife last night because it's such, you know, it's like an entire dissertation or essay or book could answer that question. But I think I'll give it like a multifaceted response, I hope. Um, And that's first, I think, to kind of define those terms because, you know, they're, they're kind of heady terms that not everyone has experienced. Um, So queer for me, when I define it, I rely on three different understandings of the word queer Um, One is as an umbrella term for the LGBTQIA plus community that eventually becomes alphabet soup and has different power dynamics depending on what letters are placed where. And so to say queer kind of includes everyone. And it also includes both sexual orientation and gender identity. And because trans and gender nonconforming folks are so left out of the equation, um, queer is a way to kind of open that embrace, expand that embrace. So that's one understanding. A second understanding is just kind of a nod to the academic discipline of queer theory, which seeks to dismantle binaries and say that if we say you can only be man, woman, male, female, gay, straight, and that there's no like beautiful, nuanced, interstitial space in between, that that's oppressive and damaging for people. And that would be why, for example, now over 50% of teenagers don't identify as only straight, you know, because we're acknowledging this in-between space. And then the third way of, of defining queer is, is this reclamation within the queer community of the definition of the word, which is to subvert or intentionally transgress the status quo. And in that ways, it becomes a verb, 
um, that you're queering something, you're subverting something. And so for me, when I refer to queerness, I refer to all of those things, all three of those definitions. And in that approach to the body, that's to say there is not one normative way to be a body, that there's not one normative way to be man or woman or male or female, but that it's up to the individual to define their own identity and their own body. So that would be kind of the queer approach. The intersectional feminist approach um, is that intersectionality um, refers to the fact that feminism shouldn't just be about women's liberation, but that if you are doing women's liberation at the expense of the liberation of people of color, queer folk, differently abled bodies, et cetera, et cetera, all those different isms used to divide, um, that that's not true liberation. Um, And so to do it in a way that honors race and ethnicity, religion, size, um, sexuality, all of those things. So for me, that would be a lot of the queer stuff I already said, but also I think a queer intersectionally feminist approach to the body is body positive. It's fat positive. Um, it acknowledges um, a variety of ways that disability manifests itself in the body in ways that we both see and don't see. Um, and it also, for me, um, acknowledges the bodies of others, um, so of animals and of the earth, in a sense that it uh, treats them with respect and dignity and treats all bodies with respect and dignity and honors the sacred worth. So for me, that's why I've made the choice to be vegan and or vegetarian most of my life. It's why I make the choice to be a pacifist, um, because I want to honor all bodies and do everything that I can to honor and respect and see the dignity and sacred worth in every body and every sentient being. So that's, that's a big ask (laughs) that's difficult to do. Um, But that's the, the work that I strive to do, the work that the Holy Women Icons Project strives to do. And also acknowledge amidst all of that, that people would define that differently. So what it means for me might not be the same that it would mean for you or someone else who even identifies as a queer intersectional feminist, um, that we allow people to come up with their own conscience behind it all. Um, yes. So that's, that's briefly how I would define it. It means honoring all bodies as bodies of sacred worth that deserve to be respected and honored and seeing our own bodies as bodies of sacred worth that deserve to be respected and honored. Mm, That's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that definition. Because I think that's, it's something that like, it's very important, but I don't know if a lot of feminists have been exposed to it yet. Yes, you know, yeah. we're, we're, I, I know that I only heard the word intersectional probably a year or two ago mm-hmm. for the first time. And so I, I know that I'm not the only one that's kind of in that boat. So the, the more for that sure. we're willing to educate, the better we can all do. Right. And, and I think that... Um... That's so true. And the term has become more popular in the past few years, right? So the term intersectionality was actually coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, who um, was a Black civil rights advocate and an attorney. And it was coined in the late 80s, I believe. But it's something that we've really started talking about more in the past decade or so with kind of stemming out of transnational feminism, but um, just the idea that these intersecting social identities um, can't be siloed, that if we're going to talk about women's rights and it's mostly white women speaking, then we're ignoring a whole host of other women whose voices deserve to be not just heard, but brought to the center of the conversation. And so I think especially as a white woman. And for me, as a Haole, a white woman living in Hawaii, it's really important for me to be pointing to the work of others and of women of color and highlighting their voices um, because those voices are so often dismissed and ignored or hidden. And so as in as many ways as I can elevate those voices and stand alongside or pass the mic to that's what I want and hope to do with the Holy Women Icons Project. Yeah, I feel that, especially with my social media, with the Body Story podcast, it's like, I, I am one one person, one white girl, but I try very hard to 
my mine mostly revolves around art and trust me listeners i will be sharing angela's art for the holy women icons project on the body story instagram so keep an eye out for that because i'm excited to share it with you but but you're right like i i try to find that intersectionality in the things that i share so that I'm not just reflecting my own experience. Right. And I love that. I know some of the pieces that you've shared, I've saved where it's like um, a larger, like a, a fat body spread out really, really big and saying, take up space. And that's something yes. that I love and say, especially um, in my own history of trying to take up as little space as possible. In my paintings, almost every single icon has their arms stretched off the canvas because the canvas can't confine their story. Yes. And so whenever I speak about this or lead retreats, I often encourage folks like subversive sister saints, spread your arms wide, occupy more space in this world. Like we can't just let the man spreaders be sprawling all over the place, hold your heads high, spread your arms wide, not in an apologetic way. Um, and as a funny little aside, I even say this where I occasionally teach some like fitness classes and I try to make them be really empowering, not in the you go girl feminism kind of way, but in a really thoughtful intersectional way, which is hard to do when you're like saying like punch, punch, punch. But um, so many times when I've taken like cardio kickboxing, a teacher will be, say no girly punches and like not extend her arm all the way. And so I instead call that like T-Rex arms because you aren't extending your arms. But I say like, punch like a girl, punch like a woman, extend your arm all the way because you deserve to occupy all of that space. Now I'm a pacifist. I don't want someone to actually punch someone, but you can visualize like cis hetero patriarchy or white supremacy and you can extend your arm fully to punch that. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, or at least that's what I that visualize. Des that deserves to, to be a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Punching out the white supremacist cis hetero patriarchy. <laughs> yes. Yes, I love it. Yeah. We I, I knew I wanted to talk to you when you sent in your intake form and I think you wrote out that whole thing uh, like and I was like oh yeah this woman I'm talking to her for sure <laughs> I love it and I love this um these connecting points you know it's really powerful and in supporting one another and lifting up these revolutionary women doing amazing work in our world um I don't know it's it's making our world a better place and it's a way of kind of dismantling the systems that are specifically designed to disenfranchise or exclude us. Like, hell no, let's, let's dismantle that together. Oh, yes. Well, we're kind of drawing to the end of our time. So I, do you have any final thoughts to leave our audience with? And can you let them know where they can find you and the Holy Women Icons Project? Definitely. So it's my hope and all of these myriad connected and seemingly disconnected things that we've talked about that anyone who's listening, you can hear me, subversive sister saints across the gender spectrum, that every part of your body is of sacred worth, that when you peel back the layers of virtually every wisdom tradition and affirmation of the women's body is hidden in those crevices of the canons that are otherwise codified by patriarchy, that when we see these reflections of ourselves as icons, something empowering happens because spirituality does not have to be toxic. That women and genderqueer folks, we can find access um, to affirmation of our bodies in places like the Holy Women Icons Project and the Body Story Project and all of these places. So leave here knowing that and honoring that within yourself. Spread your arms wide, take up space, hold your head high, subversive sister saints. And then grab your smartphone or laptop <laughs> and head over to holywomenicons.com slash join. And while you're there, you can sign up for our email list, our subscriber list, and everyone who's on that list by September 30th, you were entered to win two free nights at our off-grid tiny Hawaii retreat center out here. And everyone who subscribes also gets a really awesome coloring page. So you can do some like contemplative coloring or be like my two-year-old and rage and just scribble on it. Um, and you can also follow us, the Holy Women Icons Project, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And while you're at our website, holywomenicons.com slash join, you can check out the retreats that we lead, both online and in Hawaii, or check out some artwork or writing, and everything that you buy goes right into the nonprofit. Perfect. Thank you so much, Angela. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And you as well. 
If you love the Body Story Podcast and want to be considered as an upcoming guest, please reach out to us at bodystorypodcast at gmail.com and I will send you the link to the intake form. Even if you think your story isn't unique enough or that it's not worth telling, I assure you it is and we would love to have you. And if you want to be part of our project, we do have space for volunteers and are looking for people with unique skill sets that believe that they can help us expand this operation to more avenues and more people. Again, reach out at bodystorypodcast at gmail.com and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Body Story Podcast. Thanks for listening and we'll see you on the next episode. This episode was made possible by our Patreon supporters, Stephanie Baird and Jonathan Stratton. The Body Story Podcast's editor is Daniel Vogt, our producer is Amanda Ray, and our creative director is Emily Fisher. 